Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again to our special music. Uh, thank you especially to Lori and Michael for that presentation. Um, if you didn't have time to mark your tithe envelopes, uh, I just want to make that very clear that that's how you can support that project. Loose offering goes to church budget, which also very important. But uh, we really want to uh, replenish our funds for this project that we're committed to. I mean, you've seen uh, the, the good that we do and the commitment that we've made to these certain individuals. So if even during this message you want to take time to... Uh, write in your tithe envelope, you, you can do that. I'll just assume that you're taking notes on my sermon. So feel free to mark your tithe envelopes. Keep that so that next week when we collect offering, you'll be ready to drop that into the plate. Uh, so I really, really encourage you to do that. And it actually uh, ties in with today's gospel reading. Greatest cost and greatest gain. Now, as you heard, Jesus gives lots of different parables about what the kingdom of God is like. And it's not very easy to preach a sermon on five or six different parables all at once. Uh, I won't cover all of them, but I will try to construct kind of a common theme of what's the gist of what Jesus is getting at here, and does it have anything to do uh, with how we live our lives? That's, that's the task for today. But I want to begin with a more basic question. What is the kingdom of God? Because all of these parables are telling us what the kingdom of God is like. But until we know the very basic definition of what the kingdom of God is, then descriptions of what it's like won't necessarily get us very far. Now, the first thing that I would say that we have to clarify is that the kingdom of God is not a territory. See, we in the modern world are very fixated on borders. When we think about a country or a nation, we think, well, there are very sharp lines, right? Very sharp lines between one place and another. For instance, maybe some of you have been to uh, Four Corners, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Anyone been there? I see, I see some nodding heads. Yeah, okay. So you can, if you lay down on the ground, be in four different territories all at once. Now, how is that possible? Because it's a very exact location, right? We in the modern world are fixated on borders and lines, and that's how we delineate different territories or kingdoms, states, nations, whatever you will. In the ancient world, think about it. it they're not able to have uh, such sharp boundaries all the time. In the ancient world, uh, the territory of a certain kingdom was not determined by exact lines, but it was more about a sphere of influence. So a certain village or town could be said to be part of a certain kingdom because the people in that village or town had pledged loyalty to a certain king, right? You see, so it's not just about a space Kingdoms are not just about geography, but it's about loyalty. It's about allegiance. So then what's the kingdom of God? But it's the community that has pledged loyalty to God. Therefore, wherever God is king, that is the kingdom of God. So we have to get out of our heads the idea that the kingdom of God is only somewhere else maybe only in heaven or only in the future. While that is also true, the fundamental reality, these, even the expression that we see here in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven, it refers to the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is not just heaven, but as the Lord's Prayer expresses, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is not about the location of heaven, but the reign of heaven, even on earth. Does that make sense? So, these parables that tell us about what the kingdom of God is like, they're telling us what we ought to be. Because whenever and wherever God's will is done on earth, these are little breakthroughs of the kingdom of God into our world. So therefore, when Jesus is describing what the kingdom of God is like, he's describing what we, the church, ought to be. 
So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward, that Jesus, in giving these short parables, is describing his plan for us and is showing us how we can be who God has called us to be. So, first, Jesus says the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And the second parable is like it. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. So the first lesson that Jesus wants to share is that God takes the most insignificant, the most unnoticeable things in the world, and he transforms them into the greatest masterpiece. The greatest shrub comes from the smallest seed, and just a little pinch of yeast can transform a whole loaf of bread. And this theme of reversal is so central to the whole message of the New Testament. We see it from Jesus time and time again. You've heard the expression. Jesus uses it repeatedly. He says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. The smallest will be greatest. The poorest will be richest. The weakest will be strongest. This idea that the first will be last, and the last will be first, is the very center of our faith. It's the very heartbeat of Christianity, this reversal of fortune. Christ is first in the kingdom of God. Paul says in Philippians 2 that God has given him the name that is above every name. And why? Because Christ is the one who took the very lowest place. The Bible says of Christ, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You've heard that expression. What does that mean? But that the stone that no one wanted to use, the stone that everyone thought was unusable, unsalvageable, the stone that's thrown onto the rubble heap, that's the stone that God chooses and says, I will build my temple on that. The man that the world rejected, the man who had nothing, this is the one of whom God says, this is my beloved son. The father's exaltation of the humiliated Jesus is what Paul refers to as the message of the cross. The message of the cross. The idea that God would save the world through a crucified man is the most ridiculous thing anyone could ever imagine. And that's why he tells the Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Why is it the power of God? Because it's by using the weakest, it's by using the lowest that God's power is made known. He goes on to say, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Paul then turns to the Corinthians and he says, Consider your own calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. He chose the things that are not to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. I think maybe you've heard me uh, read that passage before, and I've said that I think this is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. It is, by very definition, the revolutionary message of the gospel. Because what's a revolution? But it's a turning over, right? RPMs, revolutions per minute, turning over. A revolution is to turn the world upside down, and that's exactly what the gospel is about. That God uses the things that are nothing to bring to nothing the things that are. God is delighted to use the small and insignificant things of this world because it is through them that his power is revealed. Like a tiny 
tiny mustard seed that can grow to a shrub that is 30 feet tall. God uses our weakness to show his strength. Like a little pinch of yeast that can leaven a whole lump of dough, God takes what is small and he uses it to transform everything around us. And it's because God delights to use the poor and the weak that the kingdom of God is described, as I said, as this upside-down kingdom. We see it, for instance, at the very beginning of Luke's gospel. When Mary first learns that she will be the mother of the Lord, she sings God's praise for this reversal of fortunes, that she, a lowly servant girl, would be the mother of God. Listen to her words. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. In short, to say that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed or to say that it is like yeast is to say that the kingdom of God is a collection of nobodies, a community of weaklings, a gathering of fools. But God uses this band of misfits to conquer the world with his love. And you may ask yourself then, why? How is this possible? What's the key ingredient? What is it about the poor and the weak and the foolish that God prefers to use them? What is it that makes them fit for the kingdom of God? Well, we see the answer to that in the next pair of parables. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. What's the message of these parables but that the kingdom of God is something that requires everything from us? The hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, in order to obtain it, these people in the stories sell everything they have. The kingdom of God demands that we give everything. In fact, it demands that we give our very lives. And this is it. This explains why the kingdom of God is a kingdom, Jesus says, that belongs to the poor and the weak and the foolish. We see this on display in the story that you all know very well, the story of the rich young ruler, to whom Jesus says, go and sell all that you have, just like the characters in these stories. But the Bible says that this rich young man goes away very sad because he was very rich. You see, the more you have, the more difficult it is to let go when God calls you to give everything. Because this command to give up everything is not just for this man. Sometimes we misread that story and we think that Jesus is delivering a special test for this particular person. But after the rich young ruler walks away, Peter turns to Jesus and says, Lord, we gave up everything to follow you. Because that is the cost to enter the kingdom of God. Every kingdom, think of it this way, every kingdom demands a tax. That's part of, in the ancient world, how you can determine which kingdom you're a part of, is who do you have to pay taxes to, right? This is why taxation was such an important theological issue 
for the Jewish people of the first century. Because every kingdom demands a tax. And you might think, oh, 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 yeah. So God requires 10%. 10%, that's God's tax on us, right? A tithe. 10% of everything we have, we give to God. No. The kingdom of God requires 100% tax. Everything you have. Every penny. And not just your wealth. Jesus says that we must give up our very lives to follow him. We hand it all over to him. We give up everything we have. Now, of course, then, the poor, the weak, the foolish enter into God's kingdom first. Why? Because they are already closer to the bottom. They're already closest to where God intends for us to be closer to the humble and lowly position that God is calling us to. They are already tiny mustard seeds. And so God is prepared to use them to overgrow the world. So just like in the parable, the one who sells everything he has to purchase something that is worth far more than he had before, so Peter, when he says to Jesus, Lord, we gave up everything to follow you. Jesus responds by saying, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive a hundredfold and in the age to come eternal life. For the first will be last, and the last will be first. Those who want to save their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will find it. When we give up what we have to enter God's kingdom, the reward will always outweigh the cost. Just ask yourself this question. Would you rather win the lottery or be free from all anxiety? Would you rather be the president of the United States or would you rather have a peace that passes understanding? Would you rather have, say, a hundred years of comfort and ease and good health or would you rather spend eternity in the joyful presence of God. The invitation, as always, is to let go. Let go of all of it. Whatever it is this week that has been weighing you down, let it go. All of our anxieties, all of our fears, our stress, it comes from our attachment, it comes from our clinging to life, and God pleads with us, to find peace by letting go. Letting go of everything that we have so that we can purchase the one thing in this life that matters, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We have to pursue first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? But that when things in your life are weighing you down, when things in your life are overwhelming, don't carry those burdens. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. When you pray about your circumstances, don't pray that your circumstances change. Pray that God would change you to be one that through those circumstances, God can make you righteous. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, God uses suffering as a tool for our sanctification. We can't run from it. We have to embrace it by seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. So these four parables, the mustard seed, the yeast, the treasure, the pearl, when taken together, they deliver one simple message. God wants to use you to do great things. So don't be discouraged by how little you have. Don't be discouraged by how uh, unqualified you might feel. The only thing that God asks from you is that you turn over what you have. 
however little, however much. If you cling to what you have in life and try to build something for yourself without God, it will never amount to anything. But even if all you have is a little mustard seed of faith, give it to God and see him do incredible things. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you have given us your word that if we entrust our lives to you, you will give us the greatest reward, the reward of your face. So God, give us strength, give us courage, give us faith to seek you above all things. Lord, we need your spirit. Bless us, we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.